I'd like to start this video out with a story. When I was late into elementary school, I was just starting to make my way into PC gaming, whereas previously I had mostly stuck to consoles. Though at this point I didn't have too much experience, mostly playing Minecraft, Terraria, and a few Valve titles like TF2 and Portal. I hadn't built up the taste in games that I have today, but an event around this time would inadvertently set me down the path of thinking about games more critically and eventually making this channel. When you hear the name GameStop, you'd likely think back to the events of January 2021, but before that, and before worldwide lockdowns, it was simply a store that sold video games, as well as general peripherals and merchandise centered around games. But what's relevant to this story is the power-up subscription service that GameStop provides, giving several store benefits and, most importantly, a subscription to Game Informer magazine. My older brother was subscribed at the time, though this was more for the store benefits than the free magazines, so they would usually be ignored or stashed away somewhere. But there was something about these magazines and the reviews that made me spend hours reading them over and over again. I specifically remember the editorials on the mainline Zelda games released with their Skyward Sword cover story being particularly enthralling to me, probably in part due to my interest in the franchise at the time. But in another issue, I was drawn to one particular review close to the back cover for a game called The Stanley Parable. The way the game was described in the article, along with the screenshots provided, made for a game that looked so different from anything I had ever seen. I had to play this game. And when I finally did, I loved it. The Stanley Parable was my introduction to the idea of games as art, an idea that I would fully embrace as I grew older. When I first played it, I enjoyed it as a brilliant comedic adventure through a bizarre nonsensical world, and as a break from the gameplay-driven games I was used to. But as I've matured, I've found so much more to love about this game. But aside from my own experience with the game, The Stanley Parable was still very important to the Games as Art movement. Even before the 2013 remake, the game's original incarnation as a Half-Life 2 mod joined the likes of Dear Esther and Proteus around the same time in going against the gameplay-oriented norms of games. Though, of these three, The Stanley Parable was always the most approachable for a general audience, carrying a sense of humor and wit in its writing that had no place in Dear Esther's depressive and contemplative prose, or Proteus's embrace of aesthetics and game feel over goals or intricate gameplay systems. But more importantly, The Stanley Parable mod was ostensibly the beginning of the indie meta-narrative, with the game's repeated rejection of the fourth wall making way for blatant yet scathing critique of illusory choice and player involvement in game stories, which would pave the way for the likes of Undertale, OneShot, and Doki Doki Literature Club to use similar storytelling devices to tell stories with more serious tones and similarly interesting ideas. And of course, the full 2013 release only further added to the mod's brilliant premise with many more interesting concepts to explore. So, when it was announced at the Game Awards 2018 that there would be another remake of the game released in the near future with entirely new content, I was understandably very excited. Though I had to think, is the Stanley Parable a game that could be improved by adding more content? The game seems so perfectly and deliberately paced in the design of every hallway, and how every one of its branching paths are placed along those hallways. Is this something that could be translated while adding more? Are there even enough new ideas to explore that would warrant an entirely new release of the game? But I had faith in the developers to truly surprise me with the answers they would come up with. And after three years of delays, the game finally released, and... I said in my video about Fez that that game is the most unique game I have ever played. But at this point, I'm ready to hand that title to the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. The most concrete thing I can say about this game is that I'm confident that there has never been any piece of media quite like it, and there will likely never be anything like it again, at least not for a very long time. It's a game that made me feel things I've never felt before, it gave me an experience I've never had before, and at the risk of sounding more comedic than I intend, it thoroughly subverted my expectations. But I was right in my skepticism about this game's premise. Is the sublime pacing of the original something that could be translated while adding more? No. Are there enough new ideas to explore that would warrant an entirely new release of the game? No. By the time I'd seen every major piece of new content, I was somehow less sure on what this game was about than I was before it released. So at this point, as much as I would have loved to say, let's analyze the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, I'm not sure if I can do that right now. I'm not sure if the game could be analyzed under the lens I usually apply to these sorts of games. Instead, what I think I need to do is to come to terms with the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. So let's begin. In the 
lead up to Ultra Deluxe's release, I was considering how I would structure this script, and one part I thought would be an obvious inclusion would be a look back at what the original had to say. I figured I would be able to frame this in how Ultra Deluxe is able to build off the ideas of the original. To understand a sequel, or in this case a derivative work, it would be very useful to understand its original incarnation, right? But Ultra Deluxe truly does defy all expectations, and I believe I could apply that sort of analysis to this game without touching on any of the content from the original. Of course, the original's success and legacy are very important to this new version, but when it comes to the original's text, Ultra Deluxe only barely pulls from it, and only at the most surface level. However, on a more personal level, I do think it's important to go through what I find so compelling about the original game, and what I think the game has to say. For the uninitiated, the Stanley Parable tells the story of a man named Stanley. He works a menial job simply pushing the buttons he's told to push, and is surprisingly happy doing so. But the inciting incident of this story occurs when Stanley realizes that all of his co-workers have gone missing, and he steps up from his desk to investigate. From here, the Stanley Parable breaks every conventional narrative step by not following a narrative at all, or to be more specific, offering the player the choice to not follow the narrative. There is a normal path through the game where you follow the intended story, but there are many possible paths the game lets you take instead. The Stanley Parable doesn't really have a narrative, and the game is more so structured as a collection of musings on the topics that the game concerns itself with, which is of course wrapped together in a witty sense of humor that responds perfectly to every movement the player makes, and a setting which creates an off-putting sense of dread around every hallway. When you look at every one of these paths in totality, some clear patterns begin to emerge when it comes to what the game is about. In particular, it seems to coalesce around the nature of those choices, and the nature of illusory choice when it comes to video games. To start, the game establishes a paradoxical sense of powerlessness. At first glance, you may think that the player has a good amount of power in this game, as they are given the agency to choose which path they want to take, but the game has a different perspective on this. For instance, in the explosion ending, the player attempts to turn on the mind controls right at the end of the game, and the narrator chides Stanley for his attempt to throw his story off track. As punishment, the facility's nuclear detonators are activated, and you're made to struggle to escape as a timer slowly ticks down towards Stanley's death. Across the room, there are many useless interactables that carry absolutely no purpose, and no matter how you interact with the world, you cannot change its outcome. That this video game can be beaten? One solved? Do you have any idea what your purpose in this place is? <laughs> Stanley... You're in for quite a disappointment, but here's a spoiler for you. That timer isn't a catalyst to keep the action moving along. It's just seconds ticking away to your death. You're only still playing instead of watching a cutscene because I want to watch you for every moment that you're powerless, to see you made humble. This is not a challenge, it's a tragedy. You wanted to control this world, that's fine. But I'm going to destroy it first, so you can't. The intended path where you always obey the narrator, the freedom ending, also adds to this, as the final speech given after shutting off the facility's power seems to subtly poke fun at the player for blindly following the narrator's commands. No longer would anyone tell him where to go. Stanley stepped through the open door. Oh, how to feel. Stanley felt the cool breeze upon his skin, the feeling of liberation, the immense possibility of the new path before him, and Stanley was happy. This also comes through the cargo lift, where the ending for jumping off the lift is colloquially known as the powerful ending. Aside from the sudden cut to black on impact being hilarious, this is an important concept. Even if you can choose what path you take, what's the point of taking some of them? What is gained from you jumping off the lift? What did you think was going to happen? It's meaningless, this agency the game provides you. Good job, Stanley. Everyone thinks you are very powerful. But there's no other ending which illustrates this idea with as much clarity as the museum ending. The name is somewhat misleading, as what's so important about this ending has nothing to do with the museum filled with interesting tidbits from the game's development. Instead, what happens before and after is much more interesting. For this ending, the player walks down a hallway and willingly puts Stanley's fate in motion by doing so. Stanley is trapped and sent towards a gruesome, crushing death, but just before his final moments, something interesting happens. There we are, Stanley.
Farewell, Stanley, cried the narrator, as Stanley was led helplessly into the enormous metal jaws. In a single visceral instant, Stanley was obliterated as the machine crushed every bone in his body, killing him instantly. And yet it would be just a few minutes before Stanley would restart the game back in his office as alive as ever. What exactly did the narrator think he was going to accomplish? When every path you can walk has been created for you long in advance, death becomes meaningless, making life the same. Do you see now? Do you see that Stanley was already dead from the moment he hit start? The Stanley Parable is a video game, with nearly every possible player interaction in its world being thoroughly scripted out in advance. The interpretation put forward by the female narrator is that it's because of the game's heavily deterministic nature that the game does not actually provide agency. Because once you've made your choice, no matter what fate Stanley is left to, he'll always end up back in his office, as alive as ever, and then you can make a new choice. You can go back to the choice you just made and go the other direction instead. But at that point, did you make a choice at all? You're clearly meant to play the game multiple times, such that you can find every ending. But if you do eventually see everything the game has to offer, did you ever make a choice? And if those choices have no consequences, and you can just begin the game again and start from scratch, is that even a choice at all? But the female narrator has a solution, which is your only true choice. But listen to me. You can still save these two. You can stop the program before they both fail. Push escape and press quit. There's no other way to beat this game. As long as you move forward, you'll be walking someone else's path. Stop now and be the only true choice. Whatever you do, choose it. Don't let time choose for you. Don't let time choose. The only tangible choice you can have while playing this game is to stop playing it before it ends. It's the only choice that has a consequence that actually affects you, because you won't see the rest of the game's text. This is also the idea behind the phone ending, where the narrator attempts to communicate to Stanley, and by extension the player, that they can never have true agency in this world. And I'm trying to tell him this. That in this world he can never be anything but an observer. That as long as he remains here, he's slowly killing himself. But he won't and here, the narrator makes a request of you. Yeah, watch this. Stanley. The next time the screen asks you to push a button, do not do it. The game locks the rest of this ending's text behind an action that you're not supposed to take. But this isn't a choice. It's not like there's an ability to do otherwise. The game will just stay like this forever until I press the button, you may think. However, according to the female narrator, this is the point at which the narrator most explicitly offers you your only true choice you can quit the game. But there's one more ending I'd like to talk about. You may think that you've seen every ending at some point in the game because you've gone down every obvious path, but there are actually a few more endings to see. But the most important one is what is arguably the closest thing to a true ending the game has. Maybe because it's probably the one you'll find last. Maybe because it's the only one that ends with traditional credits. And maybe because it's the closest the game comes to having an emotional core. At the phone, there's another path that might not be clearly visible at first glance. As Stanley picked up the phone, a white light engulfed him, filling him not just with radiance, but with hope. Hope for a life reunited one... Wait. Oh, goodness. Stanley, did you just unplug the phone? No, that wasn't supposed to be a choice. How did you do that? You actually chose incorrectly. I didn't even know that was possible. Let me... It's here that the game pretends to completely go off script. Not the script of the narrator's intended story, but the supposed script of the game itself, which you can hear the narrator shuffling through in a couple spots throughout the game. Hold on for a minute, please. Now, let's see, we went down right, left. The narrator's voice lines are noticeably mastered differently during this ending, as if they were left without any of the filters used on the rest of the game's voice lines. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left. Later on, there's also these faux corruptions, which the narrator calls narrative contradiction, as unplugging the phone is an incorrect choice that breaks the game. 
But of course, this is a facade that doesn't stand up to scrutiny. This is just as much a scripted part of the game as any of the other endings. But this is establishing a lack of control on the part of the narrator as well. Despite intuitive implications, the narrator is just as powerless to the game's script as Stanley and the player are. This sort of relationship is alluded to by the female narrator once you decide to leave the museum. <laughs> oh, look at these two. How they wish to destroy one another. How they wish to control one another. How they both wish to be free. Can you see? Can you see how much they need one another? That's why she tells you to quit the game. Not only because you'll never truly be free in this game, but also because the game needs you. At the end of the choice ending, after you're prevented from pursuing the story and after returning to the two doors, there's an interesting scene where you're placed out of bounds, outside of Stanley's body, and you hear the narrator plead with Stanley for him to do something. Stanley? Hello? Are you... Is everything okay? Stanley, please. I... I need you to make a choice. I need you to walk through the door. Stanley is simply a body you inhabit that the narrator recognizes as part of his story, and through that you are able to walk the various paths the game provides and see its various endings. Without you, Stanley is a lifeless husk, and the game cannot function. But that should be a reason for the player to keep playing the game, right? Well, here's the argument from the perspective of the female narrator. The Stanley Parable is a game with no concrete endpoint. There are endings, of course, but unless you consciously go back to its title screen and press quit, the game will loop forever. The slogan plastered across the game's loading screen says as much. The end is never 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 the end is so many secret bits hidden away just out of sight in a world that begs to be explored even more. There are significant secrets hidden behind the developer console that you can only access through Steam launch commands that contain some of the funniest writing in the whole game. But even with this, the game's content is finite, like all games. At some point, you have to stop playing this game, and the female narrator encourages you to do this, because you'll have to do so eventually. Even if the game can't function without you, it cannot keep you trapped here either so it's better for you to simply leave. The Stanley Parable is a game that internally has no purpose, wrought with contradiction to its core. It requires the player's input to stay alive, but it begs for you to leave. It's a game that has endings, but it never ends. It's a game where you play as a man named Stanley, but you also don't really play as a character in the traditional sense. It's a game that follows a story, but it also doesn't. It's a game with choices, but the game doesn't think you have agency. I don't think it's a coincidence that these are the exact contradictions that the game markets itself with. But hopefully I've communicated what's so special about this game, because not only are these concepts interesting, they were also novel at the time. And even still, The Stanley Parable remains a truly unique game to this day, with so much to say that is still relevant to modern games almost 10 years later. You might have noticed that in my previous summary, I mentioned only six of the game's endings, which omits the majority of the game's content. While I could theoretically include every ending in a full analysis, and if I wanted to do an exhaustive breakdown of the game that's what I would do, most of these endings seem to be more so focused on building tone, whether that be the unnerving feeling of liminal space that the office setting evokes, or the brilliant comedic sections that put the player's every move in a hilarious context. But this is what people remember the Stanley Parable for. It's not for its musing on choice and free will and its own pointless existence. It's for the adventure line or the time the narrator boots up Minecraft and Portal inside the game, or the ever-memorable broom closet. So now that I've gone through all that, let's get to the point. I've been dancing around what I think about the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe for a while now, though you may be able to guess given what I've titled this video, but it's time for me to give some concrete opinions. When I said the game made me feel things I've never felt before, I meant it because I've never felt so disappointed, frustrated, and empty at the end of a game ever before. I hated it. The majority of its runtime was a complete and utter bastardization of what I loved so much about the original. When the new content was advertised as having a script about as long as the original game, I was completely taken by surprise to find that probably over half of that script space was taken up by rewritten endings that take only the surface level aesthetics of the originals and completely remove any wit, subtlety, and charm in its writing by replacing it with a single two hour long joke about a bucket. 
It starts off decently funny, and it is humorous in just how far they go with a single joke, but when I stop to think about what these endings actually say, I can't help but see it as an insult to the original and its ideas. But even past that, the totally new stuff present in this game is either heavily derivative of concepts from the original, or just feels entirely underwritten. Both the memory zone and the sequel show floor seem to be lifted directly from the isolation pod and the demo construction facility from the original game's demo. They clearly couldn't secure the rights to include Minecraft in the game again, so the game's endings games are changed to Firewatch and Rocket League, which don't fit nearly as well both tonally and thematically compared to Minecraft and Portal. One of the new endings is just a bug from the original, given some narration acknowledging that it was a bug in the original, with absolutely nothing more interesting past that. The elevator to the mind control facility has an up button now, and it leads to a half-decent concept executed with such overproduction and a style over substance approach that it ends up being incredibly tonally dissonant from the rest of the game. A new vent found in the cargo room leads to an ending with another decent idea that is so woefully underwritten that it fizzles out and just ends before it can say anything interesting. The problem here is that Ultra Deluxe decides to completely turn its back on what was so interesting and insightful about the original, opting instead for a purely comedic adventure that has some decent moments here and there, but simply pales in comparison to the original's comedy with purpose, with the new comedy actively infringing on the original's tonal core. But people remember the Stanley Parable for the adventure line, and the baby, and the broom closet, so this is what we get. Why did the Stanley Parable need all these shallow gags haphazardly added onto it? Was the original game not good enough as is? But if you've played the game, you might be very frustrated by how dismissive I'm being. After all, those last couple questions seem very familiar. Nine out of ten. Don't you get it, Stanley? The game was perfect. It didn't need anything else. It didn't need new content. It just needed to be left alone. To spend the rest of time collecting dust in the hallowed hall of beloved video game memories. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to make a serious work of art. I suppose I could write up a handful of gags to insert into the Stanley Parable, but the game is already such a densely layered web of profound philosophical insights that I can't even imagine where I'd have the room to stick them. But they didn't understand the game was never meant to be funny. It was meant to have a point. It was meant to speak to the human condition. But where are the jokes? Where are the jokes? They bemoaned, they screamed, they gnashed their teeth and said, entertain us. Of course, coming off the original's profound sense of self-awareness, Ultra Deluxe is well aware of its shortcomings. It seems like this was the plan from the start, if the announcement trailer is anything to go off. We'll package it up with the original game, and we'll put it on consoles, and everyone will buy it again because they're suckers. Come, come. The game is, in its simplest form, a commentary on lazy game developers and publishers using a pre-established IP to make a cheap sequel or re-release for a quick buck. When the narrator is showcasing the sequel, you see all these horribly corporate, brand-centered posters, surrounded by whiteboards used during focus meetings about marketability. A merch store sits in the corner of an expo hall for half-baked prototypes of features for potential shareholders to examine. The Stanley figurines also exemplify this critique of marketable design over good design. And since interesting ideas and a nuanced exploration of those ideas are not marketable, they cannot be focused on, and are even repressed with the inclusion of the bucket. In fact, bringing the bucket to the start of a confusion ending is the best showcase of this mentality in action. The narrator gathers all of the quote-unquote characters from the original together, decrying the bucket as being sequel content. Much time with it. Don't you want another story involving the adventure line? We could make the adventure line go somewhere new! Yes, yes! That's what the fans want! Let's do it! Whee! Look at that wacky line. Who knows where it'll go off to next? Oh, and it played some silly music as well. Now this is what the Stanley Parable is all about. Don't you remember all those great jokes from the original dialogue? Also, Stanley is addicted to drugs and hookers. <laughs> yes, it's as classic now as it was back then. Let's do it for the fans, Stanley. Let's give them more content exactly like this. The Stanley Parable was a complete experience that explored its concepts to a point that it seems was satisfactory for its authors. So what can be done with another game in this series? All that's left to do is to provide hollow, soulless fan service, to give more of the adventure line and its wacky music. This is what the Stanley Parable is, and by simply giving more of it to people, the game receives unflinching, overwhelmingly positive feedback from audiences, at the small expense of alienating people like me who appreciate the original for its themes and message. 
Judging by the response this game has gotten, even from the wider public, it seems to have worked. And as long as the masses are entertained, what does it matter? That's what the narrator's final rant in the skip button room is about. A world where directionless comedy is valued over intricate ideas wrapped up in purposeful satire. Simple entertainment is what most people see in the Stanley Parable, so we get a new game that seeks only to expand on that, leaving behind the original's core in the process. It seems that this is now the world we live in. It seems that we are a people living in such bleakness and discomfort with ourselves that our entertainment is now our lives. It has come to represent us. It absolutely must speak to who we are as people, because otherwise, without our entertainment, we have nothing. Without entertainment, we would have to face inward toward the cruel bleakness inside ourselves. We would turn to look at our deeper nature and find a resounding emptiness gazing back with unyielding aggression. And so, so because of this, we require that our amusements and our playthings and our flights of fancy be so impossibly captivating that they consume all of our attention, turn our heads completely away from the bleakness. In effect, we have demanded that our entertainment be the collapse of ourselves. What a pitiful reflection of humanity these entertainments are. This is what Ultra Deluxe says, but it's also what it does. It provides commentary on lazy derivatives of existing works that completely miss the soul of the source material by being a derivative of an existing work that completely misses the soul of the source material, though this game clearly had plenty of effort put into it. Even acknowledging this, I can't simply think my feelings of disappointment away. I waited over three years for this game through every delay, checking the studio's Twitter account every day for over a year in anticipation of its release. When the game does nothing to expand on that soul that its source material so wholly embodied, how could I not feel disappointed? But I think just talking about my feelings can't bring this video much further, and I think I've made my feelings on the game clear by now, so I think the last question I need to ask is this. Is the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe a good game? I'll give a little spoiler here. My answer to that question is, I don't know. And for the rest of my time here, I would like to try and rationalize that response. First of all, this question is still somewhat subjective and based on my own feelings, but I'd like to try and cut through my own biases and emotional reactions in order to examine the game from an uncompromising point of view. But then, when I find the game so roundly disappointing, how could I even entertain the question of whether or not the game is good? Maybe it should be a no-brainer, but as I've said before, Ultra Deluxe is a truly unique game. And I think that by looking at the game from certain angles, even given my distaste for its contents, I could find it good. The question then is whether or not looking at the game from those angles is justifiable and reasonable. When it comes to artistic expression, evoking negative emotions is not always an inherent negative that brings the piece down. If you're looking for simple, no-strings-attached entertainment, it can be, but there are so many negative emotions that can enhance stories and the messages those stories can bring. For instance, Pathologic 2 is a game that routinely evokes a whole host of feelings that games usually avoid. Hopelessness, desperation, tedium, boredom, and stress at the same time. These are all emotions that are felt throughout the entirety of the game. The game then uses these feelings to thoroughly immerse players in its world and its story, and it turns out to be one of the most captivating stories I've ever experienced. Even in the original Stanley Parable, the narrator's prototype for the baby game is one that requires four hours of mindless, tedious button pushing in order to evoke the desperation and tedium of endlessly confronting the demands of family life. So I can in good faith simply write off the emptiness that Ultra Deluxe left me with as an objective negative, as that feeling could be important when it comes to theme. And it obviously is, right? Ultra Deluxe uses that feeling of emptiness, that way that the new additions to the game seem to fizzle out into pointlessness, in order to make its point on consumer habits, corporate sequels, and its own abandonment of the original's magic. Though that's just it. That is what Ultra Deluxe says, but this is also what Ultra Deluxe does. It is that shameless abandonment of the original's brilliance, stretched out into two hours of wacky random bucket content. But that's the point. By showing us how tonally dissonant and lifeless the game ends up being with the approach it takes, it shows how worthless follow-ups and sequels like this are. That's the... intention. I think that's the most important question. Does that intention matter? The game was only being a soulless cash grab ironically, and the developers are ostensibly well aware of its holes and failings. So then, does that mean that I just didn't understand their brilliant artistic vision? From my point of view, I see two possibilities. 
Ultra Deluxe is a bad follow-up that just doesn't live up to the original. Or Ultra Deluxe is a brilliant work of subversion, in which the developers toyed with my emotions and love of the original to sell its own unique message. But I have some issues with the latter. When I think about a game, movie, book, or whatever piece of media, I think about its story, its characters, its ideas, its text. What I do not look at is the intention of its developers, directors, authors, or creators. This is the basis behind Death of the Author, which is a concept that I like to think I have consistently applied across every game I've examined. The intentions of this game's authors do not matter when it comes to examining the text. Consider this. If the developers of Ultra Deluxe decided to indicate in some way that they believed that the new game thoroughly lived up to the thematic core of the original, whether that be through responding to negative reviews or some sort of official statement, would that change anything about the game's text? Would that make the game worse in some way? What if the game was created not by the original developers, but by a team at EA or some other AAA developer? Would that require a change in one's perception? I don't think this is a good way to go about critique or analysis of anything. Also, I don't know if they did it ironically, so now it's subversive, is a particularly sound argument. When someone makes a game designed to disappoint me, I think that just makes it a bad game, and it makes it feel like I wasted my time waiting for this game to release. I remember when I played the original for the first time. The game gave off a sense of a larger world, especially with the amount of ground and different environments covered in the confusion ending. There are so many closed doors along every path just begging to be opened and explored. It's the kind of game I would have dreams about. Dreams that there was some new path leading to new parts of the office, or even new offices or entirely new environments. I dreamed of making my own game in this vein, or expanding upon the foundation that the game already provided. But I know now that it's pointless to add more to this game that is so devoid of filler and so intentional in its every step. That's what Ultra Deluxe tells me. In its own pointlessness, it tells me that The Stanley Parable was a game that cannot simply be replicated and added to while maintaining its charm. I guess at this point what I'm clinging to is some sort of legacy. The release of The Stanley Parable in 2013 was big, at least for an indie game at the time. It was one of the games that led the explosion in big-name indies around the early to mid-2010s, along with the lineup for Indie Game the Movie and others. It precipitated the huge indie meta-narratives that would follow in the coming years. It reached the mainstream, whether that be through the then-thriving genre of Let's Plays on YouTube, or even through its appearance in an episode of House of Cards. It was a truly special game, not just for the world of video games, but for me. As I said before, this game was my gateway into the world of video games as an art form. It really had an impact on me, to the point where I'd argue that, if I had never played this game, I probably would have never made this channel or any of my videos. I just wanted this new version of the game to live up to that legacy, and if it couldn't, then I would rather it didn't exist. When you first open Ultra Deluxe, you're asked to input the time. The second time you open it, there's a character that talks to you. It's entirely ambiguous who this is, but they serve a very specific purpose in the game's epilogue. After walking by the disastrous reactions to the hypothetical Stanley Parable 2, you meet them one last time. Here, they tell you that you can create a new Stanley Parable game, just like the Stanley Parable 2. You can keep coming back here and keep making sequel after sequel, with no regard for the game's legacy. The Stanley Parable is not sacred. We do not need to protect it. Screw the legacy. Let's keep making Stanley Parable games until the sun explodes. Let's run this franchise into the ground. Let's drag it through the mud and back. And if people hate it, who cares? You see, that was the narrator's problem. He was so obsessed with what people thought of his work. Don't make his mistake. Don't cling to the legacy. Let it burn. It turns out that Ultra Deluxe is just like the original in a lot of ways. Where the original was an internally contradictory, pointless story, Ultra Deluxe is an entirely pointless product that has the narrator spouting contradictory philosophies about the worth of the original game. Where the original had no end simply because the game would loop back on itself whenever you reached anything resembling an ending, Ultra Deluxe ends with the option to keep making more games forever and ever, just adding a new number and a gaudy new subtitle and title screen each time where the original tells you to leave the game itself behind, despite its reliance on player input. 
Ultra Deluxe takes this a step further and tells you to leave behind the original's legacy as well. Maybe I am clinging too desperately to the legacy left by the Stanley Parable. Maybe I shouldn't care so much. Maybe it's time to forget and let the game be left to time. So I think I've come to terms with Ultra Deluxe as it exists. It's a game that I hate, but the game wants me to hate it. It's a game that's all about remembering the Stanley Parable, but it's also about stripping out its core and burning its legacy to the ground. And isn't that contradiction, at some level, what the Stanley Parable was all about? In a way, yes. But is it a good game? I really, truly don't know. And I'm not sure if I ever will.